Let me call your attention to three special events that are available for your enjoyment this evening. These are all described more completely in your program. At 7 p.m., the Nobel Concert, which will be held in Christ Chapel. At 8 p.m., the Nobel Art Exhibit in Schaefer Gallery. And at 8.30 p.m., the Nobel Firing Lines, which will be in Girling Concert Hall, Anderson Theater, and Nobel Auditorium. I also want to thank uh, David Feenan, the chair of the music department, and his colleagues for putting together the concert, and uh, especially um, Stan Shetka of the art department for constructing the uh, art exhibit. Now I'll ask um, Tim Robinson to return to introduce our uh, third speaker of the day. It's a pleasure to welcome Dr. Brenda Milner here to Gustavus. Dr. Milner was born in England, educated at Cambridge, where she studied experimental psychology. While working with Frederick Bartlett, she developed an interest in the study of memory, which remains to this day. After World War II, she emigrated to Canada, where she put her ability to speak French to good use, teaching at the Institute of Psychology, the University of Montreal. While still teaching at the university, she also found time to go across town to McGill University to take some classes from a dynamic young psychologist by the name of Donald Hebb. Unlike many of his contemporaries, Hebb was quite willing to speculate on the topic of higher brain function. In his landmark book called The Organization of Behavior, he spoke of cell assemblies and phase sequences and other postulated activities in what he called the conceptual nervous system with sufficient vigor and persuasiveness to convince Dr. Milner to register as a graduate student at McGill, where she finally completed a degree, her doctoral program. Her dissertation was entitled Intellectual Deficits of Temporal Lobe Damage in Man. She accepted a position in the Department of Neurology and Neurosurgery at McGill a year later and has been there ever since. Understanding the operation of the human brain is very difficult. The sheer size and complexity of it is enough to send most investigators looking for simpler species. Furthermore, the research techniques which can be employed on humans are understandably very limited. As a result, the systematic study of those unfortunate individuals who have suffered some type of brain damage has become one of the most important sources of information about the function of the normal human brain. Over the years, the Montreal Neurological Institute, which has been staffed by such world-famous neurosurgeons as Wilder Penfield and Theodore Rasmussen, has been recognized as a leading center for the treatment of such varied neurological disorders as gunshot wounds and intractable epilepsy. For 30 years now, Brenda Milner has had the opportunity to study the effects of this kind of surgery on the cognitive functioning of these patients. The most startling of these patients was a young motor winder who underwent surgery for bilateral removal of the hippocampus in the early 1950s. Dr. Milner described the profound amnesia which ensued and has followed the progress of this unusual patient ever since. She was also a pioneer in the study of the function of the two halves of the brain. Today, she's convinced that there are just as many interesting differences between the front and back of the brain as there are between the right and the left. Here to talk to us about the topic of brain and memory is Dr. Brenda Milner. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. President, uh, Dr. Shafter, Mrs. Lund, uh, fellow speakers, uh, colleagues, and friends. Uh, 
I'd like, first of all, to express my appreciation and gratitude for being invited to talk to you, to take part in this uh, Nobel conference at Gustavus. It's my second visit here, and uh, again, I uh, feel extreme pleasure to be with you. I took rather a general title, uh, Memory and the Human Brain, uh, not, uh, not how we know, but that I hope it fits a little into that context, uh, to talk really about those dissociable or partially dissociable aspects of memory that I've been uh, privileged to observe uh, in patients, uh, as you just heard, in patients uh, who were undergoing uh, brain operations, planned brain operations for the relief of long-standing epilepsy. However, my interest in memory really goes back much earlier. I'm a student uh, from my old undergraduate days in Cambridge of, of the late uh, Sir Frederick Bartlett. And so I was very happy to hear Dr. Edelman say this morning that uh, memory, uh, the memory at least in the sense of uh, I remember, uh, memory is a uh, reconstructive process, a, a process which requires a lot of imagination, a process that is not just a uh, strict uh, reproduction of something in the external world. This is indeed the lesson that we were taught in those faraway days. <clears throat> I have a plan in this lecture. Uh, I have a plan to try to cover three themes. I don't know what will happen to the third one because I, I do want to dwell a little on the first. Uh, I, the three themes also go a little historically, I'm afraid, because the first I'm going to talk about is probably the oldest and best known, but it is probably still crucial for the kind of uh, argument I want to develop today. <clears throat> I want to begin um, by talking about the characteristics of this grave amnesic syndrome, this gross disturbance in everyday memory for events as they occur, that one sees in patients who are unfortunate enough to have bilateral damage in structures deep in the two temporal lobes of the brain. Uh, the most patient, famous patient is not a patient from Montreal, is the patient H.M., who was actually a patient of Dr. William Scoville in Hartford, Connecticut, and he is the patient that we have followed over so many many years. Uh, but I have to say that there have been other patients that time does not allow me to discuss who show uh, essentially this same uh, pattern of memory loss and uh, preserved learning of certain kinds to which I would like to address myself initially. <clears throat> now I have a wonderful pointer. tailor-made, <laughs> custom-made. Uh, so I think um, before looking at the slides and talking of the patients, maybe we should reflect for a moment of the kind of memory that we take for granted. Uh, the fact that we can remember what it was like to be uh, listening to uh, the last lecture, what it was like to be at that library lunch, what lovely sunny weather it is out there. We couldn't forget those things if we tried. Yet at every moment, the focus of our attention is shifting. Uh, life distracts us constantly. Uh, and yet, we can depend upon some system in the brain to keep that continuity going, and I believe also by inner reflection on and rehearsal, uh, subjective rehearsal of events past, we do uh, update our memory, and I will try to say more than our personal memories, our knowledge of the world. Now, uh, from now on, it's going to be the slides. Could I have the lights down on the first slide, please? What you see here in, uh, I suppose one should say, a cartoon, a sketch of the uh, medial surface of uh, the right hemisphere, uh, with your, uh, imagine this half of my brain removed and you are looking in, and you will note this shaded region around the inner core of the hemisphere, circling and therefore called the, the limbic lobe. And I would like to direct your attention particularly to this 
region here, uh, which is where you have the Ancus, the parahippocampal gyrus, and underneath, where, where you don't see very well, this critical structure, the um, hippocampus, uh, and buried there also the amygdala. The amygdala, so called for its almond shape, the hippocampus for its resemblance to a seahorse, and I, everybody gives me a little seahorses as presents, and I have them everywhere as the sign of the house. Uh, now, uh, in the, the typical operation for the treatment of epilepsy, in which the part of one temporal lobe is removed, the other functioning normally on the other side, it is usual to have to include at least the amygdala and often part of the hippocampus in that removal. But since the other half is functioning normally in the other hemisphere, the patients uh, do not lose their memory of ongoing events. In the case of HM, the next slide please, the operation carried out by Dr. William Scoville, I'm afraid you can't see the top of this slide, I think it's one of the few that are going to be like that. Um, he, back in the early 50s, carried out what was frankly an experimental operation long thought about before decided upon in this uh, young man who was totally incapacitated by major uh, seizures and was on near toxic doses of all the available anticonvulsant medication of that day. Uh, the operation, uh, which was not like the ones carried out in Montreal, differed in, in two ways. First, that it was bilaterally symmetrical, which is something that always, I think, should worry a surgeon. Um, bilaterally symmetrical and did not involve the temporal neocortex. It involved just those structures I've illustrated to you, the uh, um, amygdala, hippocampus, and parahippocampal gyrus, going back a considerable way along the medial surface of both temporal lobes. It was a radical procedure. Now, Dr. Scoville had carried out operations uh, less drastic in uh, seriously ill uh, schizophrenic patients in those days and had found no uh, impairment in a general sense, no evident impairment of memory in removals that were limited to the amygdala. But I think it's very important now for those of us who are interested in, in the brain and the cerebral organization of the brain in memory uh, to re-emphasize the fact that the critical operation that had this devastating effect on the memory of the patient uh, did not involve only the hippocampus but did also include the amygdala. I say this now because we are getting evidence from the monkey laboratory, notably from the work of Mortimer Mishkin at NIH, that in the uh, monkey, uh, bilateral removal of amygdala and hippocampus does indeed produce something like an analog uh, of the human amnesic syndrome, whereas removal of either structure alone does not. So I think we have to take seriously that what we're seeing may be the effect of this combined lesion. Now, what about the effect? Well, the most striking thing, of course, for anybody seeing the patient is, uh, and what his, his family and friends would talk about and still talk about to this day, is uh, his uh, tremendous anterograde amnesia, his inability to remember new happenings. And this is a, indeed a tremendous, uh, a devastating interruption in your normal life and your normal relationship with others. We were hearing in the previous lecture today about the... Uh, the computer that doesn't remember in that sense. And I think that this is very critical to the system in the brain that we're talking about, that there is not this, certainly not this updating of, of personal memories that are suit, and yet uh, the past knowledge acquired, the past knowledge of facts uh, remains untouched. Uh, we'll come back a little more to what else may remain untouched. But I would like uh, perhaps just to illustrate with a simple experiment uh, that what is affected in, when the system is damaged 
is very much what William James, writing so many years ago, uh, called a secondary memory. You remember he's, uh, James said that a primary memory, one can hardly call memory at all. It, it hasn't gone out of consciousness. It's the most rearward part of consciousness, but it hasn't actually uh, left consciousness. So we talk about immediate or primary memory, but it's a, a quaint use of the word. Whereas memory proper, says James, uh, is, um, or secondary memory, as it might be, uh, might be styled, um, is what has just previously been in your consciousness, which is out of, uh, out of mind and yet and has already dropped from consciousness, but which we have available as a sort of backcloth, I like to think, in the wings. And this is what we are so constantly dependent upon in our everyday remembering. Now, I give you a very simple little recent experiment carried out with HM to illustrate uh, this point, really, of interruption in his uh, processing, sorry, not processing, I shouldn't say, in his, his preservation of um, ongoing events. The next slide, please. This is a, a simple uh, absolute judgment task, so-called, uh, carried out by one of my former students, Don Reed, quite recently with HM. Uh, that shows you that HM has not changed, incidentally. I have followed him. I've worked with him over the years on and off. He still doesn't recognize me uh, as a familiar person. Uh, this is uh, really no, no change. Uh, in this little task, you see these uh, rectangles of various widths. Uh, and, uh, but as they are presented in the experiment, they are on a continuous loop so that you only see one rectangle at a time. And what you have to do is to uh, assign the correct number from one being the narrowest rectangle and six being the broadest to give the right name to the rectangle as it appears. And if you say four, when it's really number three you're looking at, the examiner says no, and then you guess again and you probably get four. Now in the particular instance that I have shown you, this is a ludicrously easy task, even for patients with extensive uh, brain lesions in, different, in one temporal lobe, say, or one frontal lobe. Uh, but uh, for HM, this became uh, an impossible task. He, it was not because he, didn't ha he had to remember the instructions, because there's always a sign up in front of HM saying uh, this is, one is as narrow and, and six is the large. Um, the next slide, please. And he did indeed seem in some absolute way, these are his errors, in some absolute way to recognize one as absolutely narrow and therefore always called it uh, one. But you see that he never uh, got straight these uh, three, four, and five and uh, was also making uh, bad errors, not necessarily saying the neighbor, but maybe even two away. Now, I think that th what this really means is that in your ordinary memory of something like that, we shouldn't perhaps call it absolute judgment because we very rapidly establish a frame of reference of this set, and so we recognize the, abs the individual within the set. But this, uh, in the case of HM, as his f attention shifts from one item to another, he does not build up this uh, back cloth, the, it really James's secondary memory, this, this uh, comforting continuity of experience on which we constantly rely. <clears throat> um, now, when I, I'd like to really to go back in time, and here I'll do this very quickly because it's very long ago. Uh, when I first went to meet HM. I went down from Montreal, and in those days there were uh, no planes from Montreal to Hartford. I went by the overnight train, and I took with me a couple of experiments, a couple of learning tasks from the psychology lab to see what um, HM could learn. And I was lucky in taking two things which gave different results. It was pure luck, um, and I'll just show you them quickly. The next slide, please. The next slide, this is a simple stylus maze in which you have to learn to find the path from the start to the finish. And here the path is shown to you uh, with a line, uh, but of course it isn't visible to the subject who must discover it by trial and error and remember it. Every time he goes out of the correct path, a buzzer go sounds telling him he's made a mistake. He goes back and tries something else and of course makes many mistakes on the first trial. But normal subjects and patients with various brain lesions can learn this uh, route 
uh, to uh, a good learning criterion in uh, 19 or 20 trials. Um, with HM, it was a, a disaster. The next slide, please. Uh, we, I, we worked with him over three days. The next slide, please. Thank you. And averaging his errors over blocks of five trials and with time out for lunch and so on and, going, and sleeping overnight, you see that the three days of testing, he made absolutely no progress. And at the end, I had to leave and go back to Montreal. Uh, by retro in retrospectoscope, I realized what a silly thing it was to expect a patient who couldn't remember anything once his immediate span of attention, which was normal, was overloaded, was, uh, was passed. Uh, how can he learn something with 28 choice points? And subsequently, we shortened this maze a great deal, and he managed to learn a very simple version of it in 155 trials. But uh, the point I would like to make is that this extremely slow learning uh, of a root uh, is paralleled in his daily life, that this patient uh, takes literally years, years, to memorize the root around a small house in which he lives. He did achieve this in the uh, years that followed the operation, his family moved to a new house. And for a long, long time, he had no idea of the root within it. And he still, of course, doesn't, uh, didn't know the address and would give the address of his former house and guide us to it if you ask for instructions. He had no difficulty with spatial layout as such. It's strictly remembering uh, and learning the new layout. Uh, and then uh, now he has learnt this second house, but unfortunately had to move again. And it is taking him again three or four years to learn the layout once more. Now I think uh, this new learning is presumably taking place in a slow, incremental way. Uh, we don't know anything about uh, the, the locus or the representation of these very long and stable memories. We're sure that they must indeed involve large populations of cells. They must indeed be uh, distributed widely in the brain. Uh, the thing is that without the help of this uh, medial temporal, and of course it's not just medial temporal, but the deeper diencephalic system, this system in the core of the brain, uh, without the help of that system, the learning by increment is so extraordinarily slow. This is, is a sobering thought in telling us the, the importance of this um, uh, medial temporal system. <clears throat> now, the other task that I took, the next slide, please, um, was a, a very different kind of task, again, one loved by psychologists of those days, having to learn to draw, to uh, point, put your uh, pencil where in the, within the confines of this star at the point S and trace uh, a line within the confines of the star, never touching the sides. But the difficulty is that you only see your hand and the star as reflected in a mirror. And so we all make mistakes uh, when we come to turns, uh, turning points in the, may, in the, in the star, uh, but gradually improve. And I thought, oh dear, when I saw HM do this the first time, this is going to be so difficult and I'm going to be wasting all these precious time with him doing this task he won't learn. But again, I was totally wrong. The next slide, please. The, the next slide, please. Shows you his learning during exactly the same period when he was failing the maze, his learning over this three-day period uh, with a, a a completely uh, perfect performance at the end, but with no sense of familiarity whatsoever. So I think that here is the, the next message, that you can have learning systems going on in the brain, which presumably have nothing to do, because his learning of this kind of thing is normal, and not uh, using uh, this um, medial temporal system, which is related to our conscious uh, memory of things and events. Uh, this is the kind of learning, and in those days, back in 1962, I speculated that many kinds of motor skill would be learned independently of this system. By this, I meant uh, learning to dance and swim, learning to pronounce a foreign language, though, of course, not learning its syntax or its vocabulary. That uh, many things of this kind, would uh, the things you learn early in life with a lot of practice, the things that you cannot introspect on how you do and indeed trying to may impair your performance, and that are indeed very stable once learnt and carry over from one season to the next. Um, that, I think, is 
is true. That generalization I made, uh, wherever it has been tested, seems to have held up. But it was too narrow. Um, work subsequently by Elizabeth Warrington and uh, Weisskrantz in England showed that there was also a remarkable facilitation of the ability to uh, recognize again something that one not recognize as having seen before, but perceive more accurately a fragmented drawing. You show somebody a fragmented drawing of an airplane, and it's really just a few fragments. We can't guess what it is. Then you add a little more contour, and you say, oh gosh, it's an airplane, uh, and so on with other objects. So a child's test, very easy. Uh, you then show this again to the patients months later, months later, and they show better, faster recognition, require less contour information in order to identify the object. Now, they're not learning something new. This is something that these are very stereotyped drawings of things in a child's vocabulary and a child's picture knowledge, uh, but they are being, this act, early activation seems to leave the nervous system uh, ready to recognize, not to say I've seen it before, they have no idea they've seen it before, but to identify more readily at the second showing. This then is another kind of, of memory which doesn't seem to depend at all upon the medial temporal system. More recently, uh, Larry Squire and Neil Cohen have shown uh, that uh, the Tower of Hanoi problem, uh, 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 Dr. Simon has told us all about it before, is uh, something on which you show steady learning in an amnesic condition, again, learning without awareness. And so the examples multiply. And people have tried to characterize what is preserved in this case, using the terminology of, of the present day as a procedural. I don't know whether I like these dichotomies of procedural versus declarative and so on, but there are indeed different kinds kinds of memory, some very critically dependent upon uh, the um, integrity of the medial temporal lobe system. Now, uh, before leaving HM to talk of other things, but still with the temporal lobes, I have to address one more issue, which is that um, uh, Professor Tulving, Toronto, has uh, distinguished between um, episodic memory, the memory, what he calls episodic memory, which is the memory that of, of actual episodes and events of one's own life. I had lunch at the library today. I ate su such a thing last night and so on. Uh, there is no question that that memory is completely disrupted by uh, lesions of this kind, although the patients are still able to remember uh, the events of their childhood, uh, not a lot, of course, none of us do, but to remember uh, with vividness. Uh, HM will say, I can remember the first time I had a seizure, or I can remember the first cigarette I, sp I smoked. It was on such and such a highway going to Florida, and did I cough? And he will, it's apparently vivid for him. But uh, things going back for a year or two before the surgery, and that's a very long time, seem not to be recalled, and of course, new events are not recalled. There isn't any argument about that. But what Professor Tolving has called semantic memory, he means knowledge of facts. And I don't agree that knowledge of facts is preserved, or our acquisition of facts, the knowledge of, of the old facts is more or less preserved. Uh, but if you look at your ability to acquire new knowledge, impersonal knowledge, like vocabulary, you do indeed find an impairment. John Gabrielli at MIT has been studying this in HM. He has taken advantage of the fact that apparently in the Webster Dictionary there is a new, a new one brought out every five years which brings in a lot of new words. And uh, so uh, John Gabrielli has been able to check HM's knowledge of, of this vocabulary as compared with the control group. I should point out that HM is, is not in an impoverished environment these days. He seems to spend most of his time at MIT being tested by uh, generations of bright graduate students and postdoctoral fellows, and uh, otherwise uh, is 
visited a great deal, and so I don't think we can just think, well, he is in such a sheltered hospital environment that perhaps it's not fair to expect him to know these things. He also loves to watch television, though he can't tell you anything about it afterwards, and uh, he will do things over and over again, as we heard about the um, computer, without getting bored. He, I have never seen him bored. So he has this opportunity to learn the new vocabulary, but it is clear that when he is compared with age-matched controls, that he has acquired really very little. He has acquired something, more than he has of his memory of the events of his life. But there is certainly an impairment in the way in which this kind of learning is acquired. Again, I think it's this business that, that with a great deal of repetition, uh, the cortical systems involved will become modified by exposure to this information. But uh, it is an extraordinarily, extraordinarily slow process. So we have here to postulate and here I would love to know something of the underlying mechanisms, but I am certainly not going to, to venture any guesses because I really believe that that point, uh, even more than Dr. Edelman, from, because of starting from such a different vantage point, uh, that I sh one has to be very conservative. But what one requires here is a system that is modified very quickly within one trial. This memory that we take for granted as we walk around our lives is not the, the memory of sitting down to study very hard. It is the things that automatically stay with us. It is a great gift. And this uh, system then has to be modified very rapidly. It has to be modified uh, and stay modified for a surprisingly long time. That is what the facts of retrograde amnesia tell us. The long period uh, of events before such a surgery such, that seem uh, to be irretrievable. Uh, there must be something going on. This, this medial temporal system seems to be participating in the act or seem to have its role to play for a surprisingly long time. However, I don't believe it's forever. I think that most of the rather trivial happenings that are so important for us to keep, um, to be able to depend upon remembering for the continuity of our day-to-day -day lives are not in the least important to remember in the long-range sense, and that ultimately, if they are not things that are specially interesting or relevant to other things that we are doing, do indeed uh, get lost. But uh, as far as the memory for the individual events, what one had for lunch five years ago in the cafeteria at the Neuro, I think that's really gone, I would believe. However, uh, if we look at the well-preserved intelligence of patients who suddenly have this kind of surgical insult, if we look uh, at the well-preserved vocabulary and general knowledge and uh, knowledge of how to behave and so on, we have to uh, think that at some point um, this system uh, drops out and enough has been, by, perhaps by a great deal of inner rehearsal, enough uh, has been left to maintain this system without any longer the participation of what I call some kind of, uh, uh, well, no, I won't call it a name, well, this medial uh, temporal lobe system, which is so much related to our conscious um, awareness of events and happenings as they occur. So that is a little bit um, the challenge of trying to find out uh, the cerebral substrate uh, of such a system and the role it plays in memory. Now, I would like to move on to uh, considering uh, the effects of unilateral temporal lobe lesions. Could I have the next slide, please? Dr. Edelman referred to the speech areas. This is the, um, a sketch by Dr. Rasmussen of the left cerebral cortex of the typical, and uh, I agree with Dr. Edelman that there's tremendous individual variation in, in as far, he is talking at a much more uh, basic level than, than I can, but uh, I think all the clinical data fit it. But this is the generalized left cerebral cortex of the typical uh, right-handed person, adult, 
and you see in the stippled areas here which represent the uh, posterior parietal, posterior temporal speech zone, and here Broca's area in the frontal lobe. These are areas which are sacrosanct in any uh, operation that is elective. It is better to have epilepsy than to uh, not to be able to talk. So these, the surgeon has to map these areas out during an operation in conscious subjects by electrical stimulation. This was a lot of the pioneer work of Dr. Penfield many years ago. Uh, and in, by electrical stimulation in these critical zones, you can interfere with ongoing speech, interfere with the patient's ability to name and speak. And when you do that, you know that is an area that you should uh, keep out of because uh, the, uh, uh, if you uh, damage it, you will have some lasting trouble, uh, probably, with language. It is very interesting how different that kind of difficulty in naming is from the conceptual difficulty. The, Dr. Penfield has some beautiful examples in his, his very carefully kept operating room notes of a patient, for example, who was being shown a picture of a, of a, uh, a shoe. As, I'm sorry, a picture of a butterfly. And he said, tried, as he said after the electrode was removed, as he said to Dr. Penfield, I tried to think of the name for butterfly and I couldn't, and then I tried to think of the word for moth. So you see there is this, this uh, really the uh, awareness of these relationships without uh, the awareness or access to, their, to the names. Now, um, we don't then work with patients who have these areas damaged, nor with patients who have speech difficulty permanently. We work with patients who have uh, the anterior temporal region removed for the treatment of epilepsy. As you saw on the medial surface, this means removing the amygdala, and often but not always part of the hippocampus. Uh, and if you uh, do this, in, if you have this kind of difficulty in your dominant hemisphere for speech, you find uh, that uh, you have difficulty, a partial memory disorder, I call it a material specific disorder, because you have trouble with memory for words, for verbal material, what you read and what you hear, but you don't have any difficulty in remembering uh, faces and places, and so you can help your faulty verbal memory by a method of imagery, by trying to picture uh, objects in relation to one another if you want to remember to associate words. All these techniques that of course don't work with a patient like HM because HM can uh, make an image quite well apparently. You say uh, uh, nail lettuce, which are two very improbable associations as my colleague Marilyn Gottman did. And he said, oh yes, I can picture that and I have the nail sticking out of the lettuce because I I, so I won't bite it, but then later he doesn't remember a nail lettuce or the image because it is not just a verbal difficulty but a generalized difficulty. Patients with the purely verbal difficulty, of course, can be helped by this kind of imagery. Um, corresponding lesions in the right hemisphere uh, give you no verbal difficulties but give you difficulty in memory for uh, pictures and faces and so on. Now, one of the things that has interested us has been to study the relationship of the hippocampus to uh, its overlying temporal, oh, to, the, to the hemisphere of which it is a part. Since we have groups of patients, uh, the next slide please. We can, if we are sketching here the removals, these white areas are the removals. And remember that from now on, I am not talking about patients like HM. I'm talking about patients who have one good hemisphere and who are having a removal of a damaged area in the one temporal lobe. And in the left hemisphere on the left, you could have a removal, as you see at the top, which would take the amygdala but spare the hippocampus and you could have a removal just which is more extensive. And this, of course, it depends upon the individual patient's difficulties and what part of his brain is damaged. And these are the corresponding uh, representative removals in the right hemisphere. And so for many of our memory tasks, we have looked not just at the effects of, of left temporal lobe lesions on verbal memory, let us say, but on comparing the effects of a left temporal lesion that spares the hippocampus with one that destroys it extensively. 
And of course, we have the control groups of lesions in the right cerebral hemisphere. They're, very, they're young patients and they're very comparable in other ways. And I will illustrate just briefly the role of the left hippocampal region in, in verbal memory by means of two very similar tasks, uh, which gave, as you'll see, slightly contrasting results. They are what are called word generation tasks, carried out by Donald Reed. Uh, it's based on a, a paradigm developed by Slamica and Graf. Uh, essentially, what you do is produce your own list of words. I say, uh, tell me a word that uh, uh, rhymes with nice and begins with M, and you generate mice, and so on. You go and you produce a whole list of words that you are, are just uh, generating yourself from, on the basis of it has to rhyme with the word you're given, and it has to begin with a certain letter. And then at the end of that uh, task, you say, now tell me as many of the words as you can remember. It's not especially easy. It's easier if you generate them yourself and if you just listen passively to somebody else, but it's still not very easy. And you produce a certain proportion of these words. Uh, the next day, you uh, do a synonym task, a word generation task following exactly the same procedure, except that now you say, tell me a word that means the same as big and begins with L, and you have uh, large. And you say, now tell me what you find. Now, um, psychologists have long uh, ago described uh, what they call a serial curve of, of recall. If you're recalling a list of items, you remember the most recent very well. They're right there in your mind. That's really uh, James's primary memory. It's right there. Uh, you remember the first ones because unless you're somebody like HM, you've probably had a chance to, to think over them, to rehearse them a little. You don't remember so well the ones in the middle because there is more interference. Now, what do we get when we look at RAMs? First of all, I should tell you that patients with right temporal lobe lesions give you a completely normal curve for both these tasks, and so their data are not presented on the slide, just for clarity. The next slide, please. This shows you the results for the RAMs test. This is the normal control group with the recency and the primacy effect when the words are grouped according to their position in the original list. Uh, this is the, these two curves, which you can't distinguish one from another, a bit irregular, are the two left temporal subgroups. In other words, even if you have a left temporal lobectomy that spares the hippocampus, you will have a very no, little primacy effect on this rhyming task. This is one of about three studies which tend to the, lead us to conclude that the left anterior temporal neocortex has some specialization in the evocation of the sounds of words, which is probably something that is useful in getting back these rhyming sounds. The next slide, please. If we look at the results for the uh, synonym task, it's quite different. Here is the left temporal neocortical group with the hippocampus spared, and they're completely normal. No significant difference in the normal group. Here is the group with the hippocampal lesion on the left, and you see a normal, very good recency. What's right in their mind comes out, but they're completely wiped out at this, uh, the rest of the curve. And I think what you see here is a specialization, which is really due to the extrinsic connections of these groups of, of cells, that the, uh, in a sense, the left hippocampus is in, and the neighboring structures are in the service of that hemisphere of which they are a part. They are uh, linked by uh, many con connections through the parahippocampal gyrus, linked uh, reciprocally with uh, widespread areas of the neocortex of that hemisphere. And so you do see, when, with a lesion there, a very specialized difficulty. This is a little bit like HM's difficulty, that something just out of mind in the wings can't be brought back. But in this case, it is specific to a certain kind of, it's to verbal material and not uh, to uh, uh, pictures and so on. And uh, as you will see, we have somewhat different results for the, the other side of the brain. <coughs> uh, the next slide, please. Now, I always get more excited about the right cerebral hemisphere than the left. It's partly, I, I think, because we can draw some parallels from animal work. It is much easier to link our thoughts about the brain mechanisms if we can, I think, tie this in with animal work. This is just a reminder 
uh, that um, of what I said earlier in the talk, that damage to the right temporal neocortex interferes with your ability to remember, to identify uh, complicated visual patterns. This means you have a bad memory for faces, you have a bad memory for nonsense designs, as Doreen Kimura showed many years ago. Uh, this is the kind of thing you see with bilaterally symmetrical lesions in the macaque, but because of the functional asymmetry of the human brain, uh, a, a lesion on the right temporal lobe will make this deficit appear, uh, whereas a lesion on the left will not. This doesn't mean it would be not logical to conclude the left uh, temporal lobe doesn't add anything. I think bilaterally symmetrical lesions give you much more, uh, but rather that because of the asymmetry, uh, you get the effect after some clue to function from the unilateral lesions. However, this was not the question we were asking, was it? The question we were asking is, what does the addition of a hippocampal lesion do? It doesn't do anything to this, because we think that there, we know that the temporal neocortex is specialized for this kind of learning, this kind of memory. And so if the patients can't do it, because they have a temporal neocortical lesion, adding the hippocampal lesion isn't going to make, uh, on one side, isn't going to make their memory worse. However, there are other kinds of tasks, uh, not to do with language, that are affected by right temporal lobe lesions that include the hippocampus and not by right temporal lobe lesions that spare it. The next slide, please. And these are concerned with the memory for the position of objects in space. And here again, I would remind you of the remarkable achievements of normal memory. And in this case, we can go from, from rat to uh, monkey to human being, no doubt to a lot of other fellows in between, and uh, say that a very salient part of one's adaptation to the world is in noting where things are, uh, remembering where things are, um, objects in space and so on. Uh, this is something that we do very efficiently. Even those of us who say we have bad memories and so on, we can find we're really rather good at that. Uh, if you, somebody says, where did you put such and such a reprint? Well, I may not have a very good filing system, but I have a very quick image of the, of the reprint under a shoebox somewhere in a, near the blackboard or something like that, and it's probably correct. We just do this, uh, and in normal human beings do this apparently without any special effort to do so. They do just as well if they're not trying to remember as if they're trying to remember. So it seemed very interesting to know how patients with right temporal lesions would fare on such tasks. We do have evidence now from a lot of spatial memory tasks of impairment after right temporal lobectomy that includes the hippocampus and no impairment after left. But I want to illustrate this just from one, one uh, task, an incidental learning task uh, carried out by Mary Lou Smith. This is based on, a, adapted from a procedure devised by Jane Mandler. Uh, what you see here is an array of toy objects on a table. And what you have to do, you're not told it's a memory task. We deceive you. Uh, what you have to do is to point to each object in turn and you wait 10 seconds to make sure you really look at the object. And at the end of the 10 seconds, you have to be able to tell the examiner the price of an uh, object of that kind of average quality, the price in the world today. And so you think it's a, a pricing task. You won't be surprised to know, incidentally, that HM underestimates wildly the prices of everything because, again, he hasn't kept his knowledge up, his knowledge structure up of, about inflation and what has happened to the prices of things, any more than he has about the appearances of things and so on. This is why I say his semantic memory leaves something to be desired. However, come back to the, uh, to the patients with unilateral lesions. They're asked to have the uh, price of the uh, objects. Then they are given, in the original version of this, they're asked to recall as many of the objects as they can. This is not an easy task. I mean, the, the thing is covered up and they're asked to recall as many. It's not an easy task. People remember about half of them, but both temporal lobe groups can do that. It's, they've just seen the objects and thought about them and it's immediately afterwards. And then Mary Lou presented them with a completely blank sheet and asked them to place the objects back where they had originally been and measured the distance, the displacement of the objects from their original position. 
you get the same results if you do it in a fancy mathematical way, looking for relative position. Fortunately, it's just as valid to use the, uh, the, the simple-minded measure. The next slide, please. And this is the only slightly complicated slide. What we have plotted is the effect of removals from the left hemisphere on the left, of removals from the right hemisphere on the right, and what we are interested in are the points on the left. These are a performance 24 hours later, when there's more noise in the data, essentially the same results. But let us concentrate on what we are calling here immediate recall. Uh, we see that the normal control group and the two left temporal groups and the left frontal lobe group are all performing normally. There is no effect of a left hemisphere lesion on your ability to do this. In the right hemisphere, there is no effect of a frontal lobe lesion. You can have a very big right frontal excision and have very good memory for incidental observation of where those objects were. Uh, but the right temporal group with a large hippocampal removal, this is their mean error right up here. I can't reach it with my pointer. And this group with uh, less of the hippocampus out is not significantly impaired there. So that we have a very clear evidence of the important contribution there in terms of its connectivities with the, presumably with the right parietal cortex. See, the right temporal cortex doesn't have much to do with, with uh, position in space, probably. But the spatial representation is, is by a, a, a superior uh, pathway out of the visual cortex. And that we are there seeing uh, the representation of the memory of an object in a particular place affected by damage to the right hippocampal region. Well, we have um, a lot of replications of that. There is one point to add, which is that although we have called this immediate, we perhaps should not have done so, because there was, in fact, a minute or two in which the subject was recalling the names of the objects. Mary Lou has now controlled for this, and we can say that it is not, the deficit is not apparent at zero seconds or three seconds, just bang like that, but is apparent after two or three minutes interval, even unfilled interval. So uh, we have there then very clearly, uh, I think, uh, the idea that in the sort of overall economy and memory systems of the hemisphere, we do see this formal, uh, this role, its important contribution of these structures, again, I would say, getting modified in some way very quickly and uh, rather stably, but not, I think, forever. Well, I'm coming now to the third bit, which is really going to be an addendum, as I see that time is passing, but I would like to talk about another kind of memory and another part of the cerebral cortex. Could I have the next slide, please? This is a, not a very serious slide for you. It is a reminder to me of this marker, this change into a different topic, which is to say a little about the frontal lobes, the frontal cortex. We have very large removals from left and right frontal cortex for the treatment of epilepsy due to scarring of the brain in the left or right hemispheres, always sparing broker speech area in the left hemisphere, but otherwise they can be quite extensive removals or they may be small ones. We saw that despite these large removals, these patients had, for example, completely normal memory, incidental observation and ability to recall and reproduce the position of an array of objects in space. They perform normally on many standard intelligence tests, though that is another story that tells us more about the failings of standard intelligence tests than about the fact that the frontal lobes have nothing to do with intelligence, because I, I think that what more and more one finds is deficits on what one can loosely call fluency tasks, ability to generate a variety of responses to a single question, not to give you one quick answer but to uh, be able to, to conceive of, of things used in different ways, words used in different ways, concepts used in different ways. But I promised myself to stick to memory. What can we say about it? Well, this little slide is to make the point that where a frontal lobe lesion may impair your performance on a memory task is certainly if that task gives you the opportunity to organize and structure the material to be recalled. 
Uh, there is a vast literature, a lot of it owing to George Mandler and his colleagues, uh, pointing to the importance of so-called organization as an aid to recall. If you're asked to, to cluster material, words, pictures, what have you, into meaningful categories, you will remember that better than if you're, you don't, or if the material doesn't lend itself to that. If you bring uh, an informed and educated mind, if you bring your own idiosyncratically modified nervous system to bear, to, to select, if you like, from uh, the stream of, of, of new things are stimuli coming to you, uh, though that part that can be meaningfully organized into a structure uh, has a better chance of uh, other things being equal are being uh, recalled. We all, we all know this, organizing being helpful to memory. Now this is a, a very silly little experiment really done by one of my students, but it makes the point. Uh, you have actually twice as many as this pictures of common objects, animals, household tools. You're given all this rather crowded array, it's twice that size as I said, and just ask to group these objects into, uh, well, into groups as you wish, according to your own pleasure. And then uh, afterwards you are uh, tested for your ability uh, to recall the objects. You're also, your skill in categorizing is judged by independent judges who know nothing about the, the, the group to which the patient belongs and so on. And the student who did this, Antonio Inchiza, uh, showed that, as he had predicted, that uh, patients with temporal lobe lesions had no difficulty in categorizing, but still had their impairment in recall. Whereas patients with frontal lobe lesions showed impairment in the categorization, they were items that were left out, there were items that were falsely uh, classified or uh, in not sufficiently precisely analyzed in their categories, and they also had an impairment in recall. But that is a, a little illustrative experiment. The, I would prefer if I could take a few minutes to talk briefly about two other complementary or related experiments, one old, the other fairly new, which deals with the which deal with the role of organizing and judging a temporal order of external events or temporal order of one's own responses. Let me insert though one picture of a monkey brain or at this point. The next slide, please. This is a slide lent me by Dr. Nauter. Um, in which you see the schema of the cortex of the macaque. And you note here in the frontal lobe, the famous area of the principal sulcus, there is a rather silly little task, which as you probably know, many of you, uh, monkeys with bilateral damage in that region of the frontal lobes fail abysmally. It is called a delayed response task, or another version of it, a delayed alternation, in which all you have to do is, look, you're a monkey that likes peanuts, you're sitting here, and somebody taps smartly and puts a peanut underneath a can. Here there is another identical can. Obviously, if you're just there watching, you grab the peanut. But if uh, the, the examiner doesn't allow you to do this, he drops the screen and you wait a variable interval. And this is the delay. Then the screen comes up and you have to find the peanut. But the catch is that the can baited varies at random from trial to trial. You can't do this by thinking, oh, it's the one on the right, or thinking in monkey terminology, it's the one on the right. That would be too easy. And you can't do it by saying it's the green can, not the blue can, because both the cans are identical. And under this condition, what you have to do is to suppress, you have to forget, and I think that it's this kind of disciplined forgetting which is difficult with a frontal lesion. You have to forget all the previous trials and just give salience to that moment at which you are watching that, that peanut go in. Forget the other peanuts you've eaten today, forget the other trials, and give salience to that immediate one. And this is beyond monkeys with bilateral lesions there. Now, of course, a, a human patient could do this very easily because he could just say to himself, it's on the left, and remember by verbal mediation. Uh, so one tries to trick them with things that are a little more complicated. And many years ago, I uh, 
developed the hypothesis that there would, uh, frontal lesions were giving patients difficulty knowing what trial they were working on, but they were blurring the distinctions between trials, that they, they, they couldn't sort of suppress and, and concentrate on what was in hand and use it and move on, but there, there, was, there was this confusion in the temporal ordering of their memory. And I set out to test it, and I'll just show you the kinds of tasks and then tell you the results. I set out to test it. The next slide, please. This is going to be enormous. I apologize. Um, the verbal form of the task, you look at a series of cards and read the words out, like handcuff, peanut. Next slide, please. Next slide. Thank you. Then ashtray, keyhole, and so on. Imagine you're reading a series of pairs of words like that. And then next slide, please. You see these two, and you have to say which one you saw more recently. Of course, you saw both of them, but which one you saw more recently. And my hypothesis was that this would be difficult for patients with frontal lobe lesions. The next slide, please. Because we always use verbal and pictorial forms of our tasks, if we can, to bring out subtle hemispheric differences, we also had an object where, where you see a picture here, the hand, and uh, pictures of people and, and uh, representative drawings. And when there is a question mark, which one did you see more recently? And finally, the next one, please. Uh, you have art, this abstract art. This is, of course, difficult for patients with right temporal lobe lesions to uh, recognize, but th that they can recognize they, they don't have difficulty with the order as such. The, but the idea now is when there is a question mark, which of these two paintings did you see more recently? You can't do it by naming the artist because there are too many instances of a few artists. Um, and then um, on this task, Phil Corsi and I showed that there is indeed an abysmal performance after right frontal lobectomy, that the patients just cannot do this. They can recognize the paintings, but they cannot uh, order them in time. The, there is a lesser impairment of, with the pictures and just missing impairment with the words. After left frontal lobectomy, on the other hand, there is only an impairment on the words. So we got an effect in the discrimination of recency, uh, which was related to the side of the lesion, but on which the overall greater effect was from the right-sided lesion than the left. Now, before commenting on that, and this is really my final point, I would like to show you a similar but perhaps subtly different experiment carried out by Michael Petridis much more recently. Uh, the next slide, please. This is a, a task in which, again, following the idea that perhaps one of the difficulties, one of the things that the frontal, among many things, that this part of, perhaps of the frontal cortex is important for, is keeping track of events as they happen and keeping track of your own responses. So Michael carried out a, a variant of the recency, if you like. He called it a self-ordered task, in which you're really given a stack of cards, and you move with, and you are asked to touch one of the cards. It doesn't matter which. Here you have pictures. Uh, the next slide, please. You have abstract drawings, and we had a verbal form also. But let us say that on this task, you just have to touch one of these pictures, whichever you like, and then you turn the page. And on the next page, you'll find all the same pictures, but they will be arranged differently. And you have to touch another one. And you go on through these 12 uh, cards. And the only instruction is that you mustn't repeat yourself. So you have to monitor what you are doing. You have to look for the, the, the displays changed each time, so you can't just go across the page and no rule of thumb like that. And you have to keep track of what you are doing. And the hypothesis was that this would be difficult for patients with frontal lobe lesions. And again, we hoped for a hemispheric difference. And what Dr. What Dr. Trudis found was indeed a deficit in patients with frontal lobe lesions. But, and, but we got a, an interesting difference from the findings for recency, because now we found that the most impaired group on all the tasks was the left frontal group, the group with the frontal lobe excision in the dominant hemisphere, whereas the patients with right frontal lesions were impaired uh, only on this very difficult um, uh, pattern, abstract pattern. And my last slide illustrates the contrast between these tasks. The last slide, please. 
uh, showing you that for concrete words, for uh, representative drawings, and for abstract designs, that for the recency discrimination, you have a, a greater effect of right frontal lesions than of left, and the reverse for the self-ordered pointing with the same kind of material. And we think that perhaps, and this is really so fanciful, I obviously have to stop, uh, we think that if you look at what those two tasks ask of you, apart from temporal order judgments, so, uh, is the, the recency one, you are very passively uh, looking at an inexorable stream of pictures or words that come at you and what you have to do is be very watchful and signal to keep track of the events and the order in which they happen and maybe in this right hemisphere I don't really like hemispheric dichotomies because I am so aware of hemispheric overlap but nevertheless we do know that the right parietal cortex the right posterior cortex seems to be especially watchful uh, it quick off the mark, it's, it's organization to uh, ob what is happening in that external world. And maybe, therefore, the right frontal lobe within that hemisphere has a little special edge. When, on the other hand, we come to look at the monitoring of one's own actions, we cannot help but remember that it is the left hemisphere, notably the left parietal region, which is so important for the organizing and programming of one's own movements. Perhaps, therefore, it is not by chance or trivial that we do get this subtle difference between the two sides. Well, I must thank you for your patience. I, to summarize, I have talked first, and, and I would like to mention last, because perhaps really the most important message is the great significance of this medial, temporal, diencephalic core system in the brain for ensuring our ongoing identity and building up and updating of our, our memories, our personal memories first of all, but then indirectly our knowledge of facts and of the world around us. And we, if we then we look at the left and the right side separately, we see that there is this importance of the extrinsic connectivity of the regions to the overlying cortex, which gives them their material-specific specialization. And finally, this great and challenging problem of the frontal cortex that we are just beginning to explore, I think, uh, trying to look at how it plays its role in the control processes of memory. Thank you. We'll take a five-minute break and then reconvene for the panel discussion. You may hand your question cards to an usher who will bring them up and uh, deliver them to Chaplain Elvi or myself. Um, even though our panel is still in the process of reassembling, I think we'll go ahead and start with some of the questions from the audience. Uh, for the panelists that are here. Test, test, okay. There's some residual. First of all, lost it again. Testing, testing. First of all, um, we'll uh, hear a response from Dr. Dennett uh, responding to uh, Dr. Edelman's lecture this morning. Uh, uh, Professor Edelman, uh, one of your remarks this morning was to distinguish rather sharply between two approaches to the study of the brain, one of which you call the information processing approach, and the other you call the population approach. Now this puzzled me because as I look at the what I would consider the information processing approach, I see a vast range of different approaches, some of them preposterously, profoundly unbiological, some of them earnestly 
biological, and some of them appropriately neutral on this score. And so I didn't see the conflict that you saw between these two approaches. Could you, could you expand a bit on what you meant by the conflict between a population thinking and information processing? Well, um, first of all, I would like to know a little more about what you think is biological, but I'll, I'll leave that for, for uh, after my comment. Um, perhaps those are not the best, most felicitous choice of terms. But what I really meant is something like this, the contrast between um, what was called essentialism in the problem of taxonomy during evolutionary theory and its development and what Darwin came up with. It has to do with the namer and the named. And I agree with you that the information processing approach, for example, is entirely compatible at the level that Dr. Shank discussed it and you have discussed it with um, described facts, the kinds of things Dr. Milner talked about. But at the level prior to language, at the confrontation of the organism with the echo niche, if you will, with its environment, uh, surely you would agree that uh, there's no namer and named in the strict sense. It is in that sense that I use the information processing model. You'd be surprised how many um, psychologists I've met and how many neurophysiologists I've met who actually act as if the world comes in nice little packages with categories and labels on them. They talk about information going down one neuron, uh, stimulating a neuron, neurotransmitter, and um, being transferred to the other neuron. Now, when you actually investigate that, you find it's an impl implicit assumption, and it is this um, travesty, I, I would say, of the information processing model that I had in mind, not a, not a judgment on the larger term. Here's a question for Dr. Milner. When and how does present memory become historic memory? I think maybe prime, when and, can't hear, no, okay. I'll read the question and then I'll give it to Dr. Milner. When or how does present memory become historic memory? Is this an interesting question or one whose answer is well known? Present memory become historic memory? Is this an interesting question or what answer um, is well known? Um, I don't think that um, memory has to go through stages and, and filters necessarily. There's, there's quite a bit of evidence that, that um, information can be built up, as it were, in parallel systems, although maybe it benefits from uh, interaction. But how the long-term, um, the really enduring memories, I think there has to be a great deal of, of inner reflection, my goodness, and uh, rehearsal, and that maybe some things get damped down and other things get really uh, um, over-rehearsed and linked into our own uh, idiosyncratic systems. One of the interesting things has been following uh, patients who had um, say normal correct answers on an information test right after the surgery that gave them the memory loss. And then when you see them a year or two later, they have more imprecise, they have lost their precise notions of common knowledge. Uh, as though we are normally giving boosts uh, by this reactivation when we read the newspapers, when we rehearse and so on. Um, do you, you want me to answer all these or do you take them in turn? I had an earlier question about why does an excessive amount of alcohol sometimes cause a memory loss. And I'm not sure, in, there are two possible meanings to this question. If you mean, as I think you do, why is it sometimes if you go out and really drink a lot of alcohol you don't remember the next day what happened. And I, I think that the alcohol is, is really, it, it, at that amount is pretty toxic to the activity of the, of the cortex as a whole, we don't have to say it's just knocking out the hippocampal memory systems. If you test the intelligence of people while they are imbibing all this, so you test their skills or anything, there are very grave generalized impairments. But if somebody has in mind the further question of why there is this 
uh, Korsakoff uh, memory impairment uh, among some people who are taking alcohol to excess over many, many years. I think now it's recognized that this is a, a vitamin deficiency, a thiamine deficiency, and is not a direct consequence of the alcohol. Um, do you want me to go on? There's so many. Maybe somebody else should answer a question. I, I think uh, Dr. Edelman has, has one. You want to read the question? Uh, yes. Um, I have a question that says, if your population model is correct, is it not true that the theory of relativity, all of Shakespeare's plays, and indeed all of past, present, and future human knowledge is buried within the mind of each of us, and that tapping this knowledge is only a matter of, quote, pressing the correct combination or permutation of buttons. Now, this gives me an opportunity to, to come back to uh, what Professor Dennett was saying. It is exactly this that is not implied by the model, nor is it implied by evolution either. What is implied by the model is the potential or the capacity upon interaction with appropriate environments to do all of these things, not the precise information as if some large observer was saying, let there be Shakespeare plays, and then the only question is to tickle them out. Uh, if, if, in fact, um, uh, I could make the analogy to evolution, it was exactly this idea that accounted for species before Darwin. A tiger was a tiger. And if a man said, but this tiger has a long nose and queer spots, the reply would be, well, that's just a sport. It's noisy. It doesn't matter. Tigers are tigers. But it is just the fundamental point about selectionistic models that, number one, they do not have information built except ex post facto. After the selection's been made and adaptations occurred, is information defined, not before. And second of all, anything that works will do. I think it's extremely important to imply and, and to infer that evolution means that there is no progress. There might be increasing complexity, but there's no value judgment about what's a better fit or not. If it works, it works. In other words, you don't design a bird's wing by aerodynamics. What you do is you extend a leg if that works. So uh, I think this is a rather important point to make because it's commonly uh, confusing to people who hear about selectional models. They think it's stacked away like a kind of prior dictionary. That isn't the case. It is the potential for making a good enough choice that is built into biological systems. Doc, Dr. Shank has quite a stack of questions from the audience. I'm going to let him uh, pick his favorite one and read it and then answer it. I don't know if my favorite one should be ones that are funny or ones that I like to answer. Um, the first one says, specific suggestions, please, if possible, to encourage and stimulate learning in children, particularly preschool age. Um, I picked that one as the one I wanted to answer, uh, partially because I actually have a company that produces, uh, that produces educational software, some of which is available to be shown at some place in this university at the moment, but I'm not sure where. But there, anyway, there's some place where there are computers and somebody's sitting there showing software. And the reason I think it's worth mentioning, and in fact the reason I'm doing it, is that if you think about the kinds of things that I was talking about, you realize that what, a lot of what intelligence is about is the ability to explain ourselves, to self-reflect, to, to ask the right questions at the right time. It's possible to take advantage of the fact that there are personal computers all over the place these days and in the schools for no good reason, to actually have them be in the schools for some real good reason. And what you can do is you can design games that teach reflectivity or creativity or, um, or, or um, teach the ability to explain or bear upon the ability to explain. And so what we've been doing is exactly that, and we have games that teach reasoning ability and inference, inferencing ability. It's not that you, in fact, need AI to build those games. You don't. But the ideas that AI generates can help you have a sense of what there is to teach. So I do think that although the current educational software available is awful, um, that it's possible that in the near future there'll be some very good stuff on the market which reflects the view of, um, of intelligence that we have in AI. Um, let's see, another one. Uh, do you ever foresee that you will ever be able to have computers that express emotion? I want to read that one at the same time as another one that I have, which is, when computers at present generalize and achieve new insights, isn't this generalization not real understanding, not even mundane understanding, but only something vaguely and crudely analogous to it? This is a, a standard question that comes up. Um, suppose I got a computer to cry at the right moments or laugh at the right moments or be angry at the right moments in response to a story. It's possible to build programs 
that behave that way and, in fact, express the appropriate motion at the appropriate time. I have often also known people who, who behave that way, who have learned to express the right emotion at the right time. And one often wonders if they're really feeling it. And you would certainly be right to wonder that about a computer. The issue is, at what point would it, in some sense, really be feeling it? Now, I don't know that a, a piece of hardware will ever actually feel something. Um, so it, there's a sense in which that may be a silly question. But there's a real important question underlying all that. Namely, if a computer um, has a set of goals that it's trying to achieve, and those goals are frustrated, it might, um, in trying to reorganize its information, react in some way. I'm not suggesting react angrily or happily, but just attempt to reorganize, to work harder, to learn from the negative experience. And to that extent, I think that computers will, um, will express and feel emotions. Um, they won't be the kind that we feel and express, because I think that as living, breathing organisms, we, our emotions have other forms than pure cognitive form. Um, and they have body forms, bodily forms, for example. Um, and computers being basically minds will only have these cognitive forms of emotions. But they will be able, in principle, to be able to react to, um, to the frustration of their goals or to the success of their goals by learning. And that's a level of emotion which I think is important. And with respect to this issue of, of understanding, um, it's a very hard question to assess when you talk to another human being whether he's in fact understanding you. I see all these faces out there, and I have no idea whether you're understanding me. It's a good guess that some are and some aren't. Um, but I assume that you're understanding me because you sort of look like people. Now, if one of you turned out to actually be a machine, uh, unbeknownst to me, I would still make these same assumptions about you. If, if, if I found out it was you were a machine, I, because I'm a human being, would immediately assume that, well, you're not really understanding because you're a machine. But that's unfair. That's a very uh, sort of human chauvinistic view of life. Um, I do believe that machines will understand and are understanding to some extent. Whether they are understanding to an extent that makes me feel understood, which is what I was trying to get at in, the, um, in my distinction about complete empathy, that's another issue. I would have to spend a lot of time with each of you individually to, feel if, to be able to feel in my own mind that you really understood what I was saying at that same level. In other words, I think understanding is a very subjective affair, and there'll be those of us who'll never want to say computers are doing it, and there'll be those of us who'll never want to say that any other person is doing it, like nobody understands me. Um, I think that, in fact, there's a whole range of that kind of understanding, that computers will get pretty close to what people do, but probably you wouldn't want to marry one. Um, I'd like to ask Dr. Milner to answer a couple, and then we'll come back to uh, Dr. Edelman again. Uh, well, uh, about this question, yes. the question I received, the question I just received. Okay. Yes, the one you, yes, right. Well, it's really more questions about HM. First of all, uh, first of all, a very simple one that how old he is. He's 58. I used to go around saying this young man, and I, I've stopped saying that now after studying him all those years. Um, but the, the question that um, does HM know that he doesn't know, i.e., uh, is he aware of the nature of the problem? This is an interesting uh, question, and the answer is yes, it's very characteristic of these patients that they have um, insight, the patients with the bilateral medial temporal lesions. Now, HM's operation had been discussed for quite a while before he actually had it because it was a, really an experimental operation. He knows he's had that operation. He, but he knows he has bad memory. Uh, he will, uh, uh, a good example is that his mother used not to be able to leave him alone in the house because a stranger might come to the door like a, a brush salesman or something and HM would reason that he didn't recognize this man but he had a bad memory therefore he, um, it might be a friend of his mother's so he would invite this man in and the mother would come home and find a stranger that she didn't particularly want to see sitting in her living room. So this is um, uh, a, a very clear, and there is the, the as long as he's working on a problem, that's that is fine. It has its concentration, but that little moment when you are moving the the test material and putting something else in place, he becomes anxious, visibly anxious, and he says, "Well, right now everything is clear, but what went before? I have this trouble with my memory. What have I done? Have I said something inappropriate?" So there is really the continuous awareness that he is not. Uh, is it, is it, he says it's like waking from a dream. So, um, 
I have been asked something else, which is that actually the negative findings are a little surprising. I, I, I have been asked what does uh, a change in brain function would you expect after a bilateral singulotomy, and one might indeed think that as part of this system one would have some attenuated version at least. But uh, in fact, uh, Dr. Susan Corkin at MIT and all her group uh, studied uh, a whole series of patients who underwent uh, singulotomy for the treatment of pain. And they went to study these patients with a very strong prejudice that they would find all kinds of, of uh, um, cognitive damage of various sorts. And they really were not able to find anything with a very, that does, is no proof, I mean, that doesn't mean the absence of evidence isn't evidence of no function, of course, but rather that what, what this does is presumably it would ha you'd have to see in combination with some other, other damage to get um, a clue in people as to what was going on. Um, I have been asked something which I'm frequently asked, which is uh, whether um, it's valid, the question isn't quite in those words, but whether it's valid to um, extrapolate from uh, findings in patients with seizures. Um, obviously, all patients' populations, the different kinds of patient populations on studies have certain built-in disadvantages in terms of interpretation. But I think all I would like to say now is that uh, patients have been observed with spontaneously occurring illness, encephalitis, affecting these regions of the brain. They have been observed with trauma, with uh, damage to blood vessels, with things that occur suddenly in a, what has been up to that point a healthy brain. And there is concordance of the findings from different etiologies of lesions. So I don't myself feel we have to worry too much about that. Somebody else? Uh, Dr. Simon has an opportunity uh, given a question. We, want, we, we should like to hear from him. Please, sir. I guess this is my ch chance to let you hear my voice today, do my hard work tomorrow. Uh, someone asks, what areas are suited for the development of expert systems? We hear a lot about expert systems today in the area of applied AI. Uh, what areas are not so suitable, and what's necessary for the first list to grow larger? I think the criteria for suitability of a system, of, of building an expert system for some practical task, is that the set of knowledge, the range of knowledge required for the performance of that task, have a, a reasonably definable boundary around it. For example, I think Roger Shank illustrated today lots of tasks that would not be appropriate tasks for expert systems because they call for a very undefined set of uh, everyday knowledge for their performance. So when we look around the expert systems that have been built today, uh, which perhaps the best known example are medical diagnosis systems, uh, they are built on the foundation uh, of a uh, very specific and highly developed body of professional knowledge, a good deal of which, although not all of which, can be verbalized by the experts and specialists in that field. So I guess the question of what is necessary for the list of expert systems to grow uh, is that the number of fields in which there are human experts who have that kind of knowledge uh, should grow. Any of those fields is a candidate, I think, for expert system treatment. Dr. Edelman. Well, I have, I have two questions here that are related. Um, I'm not an expert in the field, but I did mention the subject, so I might expatiate a little on it. The first one is how many compounds or different compounds are found in the area of a synapse? Well, that's a very good question indeed. I mentioned only the word neurotransmitter as being the chemical that was released when the electrical signal reached the area which one nerve touches the other. In fact, what's being discovered is a, an extraordinary number of so-called neurotransmitters. I wouldn't say one every day, but the classes of them uh, are truly expanding at a fantastic rate. The way I would answer the question is this, that there are really two main kinds of transmitters. One is called excitatory and makes the next neuron fire. Another is called inhibitory and 
decreases its tendency to fire. But there are a whole set of compounds, in fact, some of them which are the peptide or protein um, uh, analogs in terms of function of opium and morphine and things of that kind, the so-called enkephalins and endorphins, which act as modulators of the system. So you not only have um, one kind, you have hosts of kinds, and they differ in the brain in different regions. The second thing that I um, think is worth saying is that people are studying the um, region in the second neuron that receives the transmitter, the so-called receptor or channel. Now it's that channel which is changed by binding the res this neurotransmitter and makes the next neuron fire. The interesting thing about that is that such channels are found not only in nerve cells but all the way on down in evolution and the number of them is absolutely staggering. Uh, the one that amuses me the most is the one that makes the paramecium reverse its direction. It's a so-called calcium channel and when a paramecium bunks into something, the calcium channel changes its conformation or shape in such a way as to reverse the direction of the hairs that make the paramecium swim. Evolution is simply incredible. Um, the, the major idea that you might take from this is this, that the brain, as Dr. Milner would describe it, is in a tight, bony box. And after you uh, develop all these billions of connections, the fact is you can't really grow much more. Well, then nature comes along with a very clever device. You don't have just one neurotransmitter. You change the grammar by having a whole bunch and you use the neuronal circuits in different ways by changing the chemistry. A beautiful example of that has been recently found by Eve Marder in the so-called stomatogastric ganglion of the lobster, of all things. The ganglion that controls how the stomach contracts in a lobster. And that ganglion has different transmitters. And depending on the ratio, the same wiring will do two different things or three different things or four different things. So on top of the billions of possibilities I mentioned this morning, we have countless others. I finally have a question which in fact was asked to me uh, privately by Professor Dennett and I think is worth mentioning. Dr. Edelman, I'm reminded of your automaton model of the so-called perceptron in which the components had adaptive and selective properties. My re recollection is that it failed to behave, quote, intelligently, unquote, because of an overly simple organization. Would you comment, please? The perceptron was an early pioneering attempt by Rosenblatt at Cornell to develop automata that did not have inherent programs but were responsible to limited environments. Uh, the automaton that we have built differs in a great number of technical details from the perceptron. One of the major ones is that it is so constituted because it's a selective machine and a perceptron is not, as to be completely independent of the position of an object or whether it's rotated or not. A perceptron was simply a wiring scheme which could or could not be varied in which the response was reinforced either internally or by the investigator if the right response came along. But if you move the object just half an inch, that was the end of that. You couldn't turn it. It wasn't recognized, in fact, as a separate object. Our automata take account of that by a variety of devices that I won't mention. Finally, um, someone asked me um, um, if I have time, um, would I share another joke with you? Well, <laughs> well uh, I'm, I'm at a loss um, in that respect, but perhaps to summarize some of the feelings I have about some of the questions and answers, I would just tell you the little tale of the lady who went to the psychiatrist, and this is dedicated to Dr. Shank and his marvelous stories. And he said, you say you have trouble making up your mind? And she said, yes and no. <laughs> Dr. Shank, do you want to pop a few off the stack? There? All right. Um, if a particular instance of failure expect expectancy, which I suppose he means expectation failure, must be understood at a higher level of generalization in order to match up with a new instance, like the steak and the haircut example, what is learned when the instances are compared? The higher level generalization seems present, already present to make the match. Um, if I wasn't clear on that, it's a good thing to clear up. Um, what happens is that when you have an expectation fails, you remember it. So I have a lot of cases of people remembering it for as long as 30 years. Um, and it lies around looking for a mate to compare it to. So when you compare the mistake in a haircut, what you're doing is you're trying to see if the generalization you made 
on the haircut example, namely that somebody should, didn't want to cut your hair that extreme, and ha in fact has some relationship to reality. Finding another one allows you to scope it. So when you find, this, when you find the, uh, the steak example, and that's also somebody doing something extreme, it allows you to say well, what the parameters on the people acting and the parameters on the doing are. So the parameters on the people acting are people in a, in a service position, and the things they're doing are things that they are easily within the, in the range of capability of doing. And this verifies for you a hypothesis you've now had for 30 years. Or sometimes you can hold this for only a week. Um, it verifies hypotheses for you. So essentially what you're doing in, in, in learning is the creating of hypotheses on the basis of explanations of expectation failures and then the verifying of hypotheses by, ne by your next um, encounter with this situation. So it isn't that it, it is, in some sense, sitting around in memory, but it's waiting for verification. We tend to learn, I argue, from two instances, not from one. An another question that's here uh, that I found amusing. Um, do you agree or disagree with the contention that a chess-playing computer will never beat Bobby Fischer? Please defend your answer. And then underneath that, it says, the answer we'll never know because Bobby Fischer would never agree to play this machine is unacceptable. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, okay, I won't give that answer. Um, I think the, the whole idea of the development of a chess-playing computer has been very interesting. It has an interesting history. And in the early stages, it was a, that's something that computers, that people do, that, and that smart people do. So therefore, if we had a computer that did it, it would be smart, so let's work on it. Um, later on, it evolved into a, a, into a, a basically, what can we get a computer to do to, to play chess and anything will do approach. And the brute force approaches actually made chess-playing programs that were fairly good. But by all they, what their, their relationship to human performance and human uh, intellectual activity was, was gone. It was just a question of high-speed computation. Later on, um, particularly under the direction of uh, Professor Simon, we got much more intelligent approaches to the problem of, of chess playing, where we were actually trying to learn what kinds of expertise a chess master might have and get that kind of information inside the machine. But I think that there's a, a fourth stage in the development of chess playing computers that we haven't yet reached. Um, and that is the deriving of new rules by first principles such that the machine itself could be creative in its own approaches. That is to say, the invention of new strategies. The thing that, that ultimately any ex really expert of any variety has, like a grandmaster in chess or uh, an expert football coach who is inventive or anything in between, um, is the ability to create something new in relationship to, um, to circumstances. The problem with expert systems, um, I don't know that, that they all work that, they work all that well, but the extent to which they can never really work very well under their current conception is that they don't have the ability to remember what they didn't get right and improve on it by themselves. They always require the human to come back in there and fix it for them. Um, I'm fond of, of, of pointing out that, that, that an expert medical diagnosis program that couldn't pl plan a, a wedding is an odd combination. You can, you can, you can be a, a, an expert diagnostician but not be able to do something so common as plan a wedding. Why? Because the baseline simple information for planning isn't built into these expert systems. There's only the expert information, nothing of what really ought to underlie it. So what I'm suggesting is that a chess playing program, although it can be built in to put in all the rules we can figure out that a chess master might have, and that's certainly a good strategy, that the best strategy is get a chess playing program that behaves the way Bobby Fischer behaved right at the beginning, namely he played a lot of chess, he reasoned about playing chess, he improved upon him, he invented things himself, which in fact may have been invented by others, but he had to invent them for himself and this allowed him to continue to invent for himself. So ultimately I think that it's creativity that's the issue in AI and that we really have only begun to look at that. I have a few projects like that in my lab, I actually do have a chess playing project where somebody's trying to have a program play other chess playing programs and learn how to play chess better by doing that. Um, I have a football coach program which is trying to invent new football plays. I have a cooking program which is trying to invent new recipes. Um, and in each case, the, these programs invent things and then they find out they didn't work so well, expectation failures, and go back and remember various expectation failures, combine them, make generalizations, and then invent something new. And ultimately, I think that's what we'll have to solve. I'm only just started on it. I, I don't know how many other people have started on it, but we're a long way from the solution. I think maybe we should uh, head, over, head over to dinner. Uh, thank you for your questions. They provide valuable feedback to us. And uh, thank you for your answers, uh, panelists.